Ah, there you are. Welcome to Zen Fits here in Blackstone, Virginia, the center of the world, but then you two are at the center of the world. So today I want to talk about Mu. What is Mu? Now I write about this all the time, and some people who are uh, have been around Zen a little bit uh, know it's a Zen cone, a uh, most famous one. And uh, in, in, uh, in, in Zen, it's considered the, one of the breakthrough cones. Now, a breakthrough cone is the barrier you must break through in order to activate the practice of Zen. You can't really begin to practice work with Zen until you break through the breakthrough cone. Now, there are several breakthrough cones. We all really have heard what they are, but we don't really understand them in this context. So the, basically all the cones of Zen are, what am I? Who am I? And this, it's all, all of them are phrased in different ways. It's the question, what am I? Am I this or that? Am I uh, a man? Am I a woman? Am I a husband? A wife? Am I employer? Am I employee? Am I a fireman? Am I American? Yada, yada, yada. Goes on and on and on. Am I molecules? Am I a brain? Am I electrical circuit? Am, what am I? You keep, it's endless. But it's always out there. It's always something. It's always a word. It's always some words that are defined by other words. If you say, well, who am I? And you come up with some idea or word, then that word is what you know, but it's never who you are. So asking the question, who am I, is also the question, what is Mu? So let's say, what is what Mu? Well, let's, let's, uh, uh, let me tell you the story of Mu. Um, it's Joshua's Mu. Joshua was a Chinese master. Uh, oh no, he was, wait a minute, yeah, was he Chinese? Uh, yeah, he was Chinese. Anyway, uh, Joshua was a Chinese master during the Golden Age of Zen, which was around 700 AD to 900 AD. That's when most of the patriarchs, most of the masters of Zen lived in an amazing period of time in China when all of these awakened masters, the patriarchs, were alive. Like a golden age, like a renaissance. Like a renaissance where you had Michelangelo and all of these Da Vinci and all of these renaissance creative people in one little space. So Joshua was, a, was one of the most famous uh, Zen masters. He was born poor, had no merit, no role. He was a woodcutter. He, you know, he collected and sold wood to help his mother. And as a young man, he had no Zen, he had no practice, he had no yoga, nothing. He was just a woodcutter. But he heard a monk passing by, reciting the Diamond Sutra. And when the monk recited the part of the Diamond Sutra that said, arouse the mind that does not rest on anything, that does not rest on name, form, feeling, thought, mental states, or even ego, arouse the mind that doesn't rest. And when he heard that, he was awakened mightily. He was awakened. So he went to a monastery to find out what was going on. Uh, and, he, and he met his master, Nansen. So he arranged to leave his mother to take care of her. And he went to live with his teacher, Nansen. And he lived with his teacher for 30 years. And when the teacher died, because awakening is not like, bam, one time and that's it. It's in degrees. You have a, an initial awakening and then you have deeper awakenings. 
So it's deeper and deeper and deeper awakening, not like there are cases where there was just one big awakening and that was it forever, like in Nisaga, Nisaga, uh, Nis, <laughs> Nisargadatta, you know, he had one awakening and that was it. But with Joshua, there were degrees. So he lived with his teacher for 30 years, and when his teacher died, he went on a pilgrimage for 20 years. You know, like people going to retreats. <laughs> I'll go to an Eckhart Tolle retreat this week, you know, and I'll go to uh, some other retreat uh, next week, you know, whatever, you know. But he went on a pilgrimage. And then, around the age of 80, which well, don't count, uh, he began to teach. And he lived to be about 120, so he taught, but he was, he was, uh, a breakthrough master, Joshu, and Joshu's Mu is the is the uh, pristine cone because it's so simple, and you cannot penetrate it with the intellect. You cannot figure it out and say what it is. It's impenetrable. It's kind of like the obelisk in Space Odyssey 2001. You remember that? So the obelisk was kind of like Mu. Whenever the obelisk appeared to the apes or to the astronauts, the mind evolved, the human mind evolved. Consciousness expanded. But the obelisk itself had no meaning. Nobody could figure out what it was. Didn't come from the known. Didn't come from what is it, yes or no. Is it this or that? Came from outside of that. So it had no use. It had no function. Because you can't name it. It had no name. It was unknowable. The obelisk was unknowable, yet there it was, you see. It appeared from outside. Had no source. Unless it was People usually call this God's grace because it appeared from outside. But it was something, but it was nothing. So anyway, I'm just drawing that association because I like to draw associations to movies because we know what the movies are. So the movies are metaphors that help us understand these impenetrable questions like what is Mu? Now, the story is that a monk... Uh, had a burning question, and he finally got an audience with the famous Zen master, Joshu. And he came to see the, with a question. You always come with a question. You always come to see the master with a question. And his question was, his nagging question, his nagging feeling that wouldn't let him go. Does a dog have Buddha nature? Does a dog, a lowly dog in China, the dog was the lowest of the animals. Oh, you're a dog, you know. They're not like gods in our culture. They were a lowly dog, you know. Does a dog have Buddha nature? Now, of course, the monk knew, and Joshua certainly knew, that the core principle or teaching or truth of Buddhism is that all beings have Buddha nature. All beings have peace of mind. It's their natural state creativity, peace of mind is our natural state. So all beings have Buddha nature. So why did the monk say, why does a dog have Buddha nature? When he knew that dogs, that worms and fleas, foxes and wolves had Buddha nature. And Joshua says, immediately, bam, not like, oh, let me think about it. Joshua said, Mu! Now, Mu, uh, in Japanese, is no. Not. <laughs> Remember that little phrase some years ago? It was a pop culture thing. You would, you would say, uh, I'm going to the store. Not, which meant that you couldn't go to the store because something happened and yada, yada, yada. It was kind of an ironic statement, not, well, 
Jasu said, Moo. But was Jasu answering the monk? Yes or no? Was he saying, no, the dog didn't have Buddha nature? Well, then he's going to be refruiting, be like the Pope saying Jesus was a fake. <laughs> you can't say no to all beings have Buddha nature because that's the core principle of Buddhism. So Buddha, Buddha nature must be awakened. In animals and other beings, it's not, it's, you don't have to awaken it. They are Buddha nature. But in humans, we have to awaken it, you know. So, Joshua said, Mu, no. Now, the question is, of course, in the cone. The cone is like a one situation, it's a drama. Cones are teaching, Dharma teaching, Buddha teaching in dramas. So, you have to inhabit the drama as if you went to a play and you, while you are watching the play, you're inhabiting the play. If you're sitting in the audience looking at your watch, you're not really in the play. Or if you go to a movie and all you're, and you're playing it and you're looking at your cell phone, you're in the cell phone, you're not in the movie. So to enjoy the movie, we have to inhabit it. We have to suspend this dark light is flashing. We have to suspend our thinking mind, our separate mind, our mind worrying about uh, what's well, what's for dinner or how long is this going to be, or uh, this is an interesting theater I'm in right now, or whatever, the yada yada thinking mind sitting there. That's suspended and you inhabit the movie and you forget yourself. That's why we love movies. So you have to inhabit the cone like that. You have to inhabit... What, you have to be the monk. What is your nagging question? What bothers you? What feeling won't let you go? Who am I? Who am I? You know, what's it all about? What's the meaning of this? Is there free will? Is there de is there determinism? You know, is there a God? Is there not a God? Yes or no. Everything is framed in yes or no. But the yes or no of Mu is, is, is asking for a choice. Is it this or that? And Jasu says Mu. So Jasu is not answering the monk, but he is answering the monk. You see, he's in a situation. He has to answer the monk, but he can't answer the monk because the question is the gotcha question. <laughs> you know, people do it on TV all the time. I gotcha. They ask a question out of which you cannot get. He ask, he ask the politician a question that's going to get him. It's going to make him refute his own philosophy. <laughs> you see, it happens all the time. Gotcha. Gotcha. So the monk was asking a gotcha question. Does the dog have Buddha nature? Yes or no? Either way, Joshu loses. So what is the monk really asking, first of all? The monk is really asking, why, if a dog has Buddha nature, if a dog is at peace, why am I not at peace? Am I not better than a dog? Why do I feel like a dog? Why do I feel useless? Why do I feel feel helpless? Why do I feel frustrated? Why do I feel like I'm always stuck, that the world is a tape loop, a merry-go-round, and I can't get off? Why? 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 So he wants the answer to the master to answer that. And Joshua says, Moo. No. So what is Moo? If Moo is a no, that is not answering yes or no. You see the you see the contradiction. You see the twist here. See the twist. You have to be the monk and the master. You have to play with these two because they're two absolutely contradictory viewpoints in the same situation. It's like a battery with a negative and a positive pole. These are contradictory poles.
positive, negative, yet they're contained in the same situation. This is a metaphor. So the battery containing the polar, the polarity of opposites generates or stores energy and you can use it to turn on your lights. So a cone is like a battery that generates energy because they, it's like a, it's like a cat tasting its tail, you know, wah, wah, wah. Or two tomcats going round, or a yin yang going yow, wow, 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 wow. But it's generating energy. The frustration, the impossibility of the cone that must be solved but cannot be solved generates the energy of frustration. It generates the energy you need to break out of your question to break out of the logical contradiction of it, to break out of thinking itself. So Mu is like a shot that heard around the mind, Mu, or a bomb going off, Mu, or Aha, Mu, or I see, Ah, and when you see, the whole question falls off. When you see, when you know who you are, the question, who am I, falls off. When you know what to do, the question, what should I do, falls off. There's no question. You look back and you can't even find it. <laughs> moo. Anyway, thanks for dropping in. Have a moo today. <laughs>